welcome, Howard. We appreciate your time for this interview with InfoMoney. Thank you, Mari. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Our pleasure, too. So, let's start. Inflation and hiking interest rates were considered major risks for investors in 2022 and 2023. Because of the economic and monetary conditions in the United States, classical investment strategies didn't work as expected. I'd like to know what you think are the greatest, greatest risks for investing in 2024. Well, uh, first of all, let me make clear and to your viewers that I don't, I'm not an economist and I don't believe in forecasts, my own or anybody else's. So uh, I don't really have opinions on these subjects. Uh, those opinions uh, on these subjects only really get you into trouble. But having said that, um, you know, uh, we had a problem with rising inflation in 21. Uh, so the central bank uh, increased interest rates in 22 and the markets did very badly. In 23, we had a return to optimism and the markets did very well. The risk today, and, and by the way, and most people, the consensus is that inflation is now under control and uh, the Fed will be able to reduce its, uh, its interest rates from the current restrictive level to something uh, lower. Uh, sometime in 24. And of course, the Fed has always also said that they, they're likely to do that. Um, so the risks are, number one, that inflation isn't really cured and that it uh, bounces back some more, which would require the Fed to become uh, restrictive again and raise rates to cool off the economy. Uh, and of course, investors uh, take this as a negative. Um, and and uh, the other possibility is that, uh, yes, inflation is under control. Yes, the Fed pivots to uh, dovish and starts cutting rates, but they don't cut it as many times or as much as the optimists think they will. In which case, the news is favorable, but not as favorable as the optimists had hope and disappointment in the market leads to uh, usually to some declines and losses. So I think those are the risks. Um, of course, the, the, uh, there's one other risk, which is that something that we have no idea about happens. And that's always a risk. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really a big mistake for people, investors to think that we know what's going to happen because, uh, you know, the world is not that, uh, regular. It's not that predictable. And there's always the possibility of disappointment. Great. Uh, you mentioned that markets went well last year. We saw a stock market rally late in 2023, very connected with this consensus. You also mentioned that the Fed, Fed will probably start cutting rates uh, probably in March, making five or six cuts this year and bringing rates back to around 4%. Um, is this forecast likely to happen in, in, in your opinion? And are we going uh, to keep seeing markets up for a while? Well, now remember what I said about not believing in forecasts. Yes. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it seems that inflation is going the right way, which means that, it, it, that the, the Fed will probably start cutting rates in 23. And uh, there, uh, the consensus, we have this thing called the dot plot. And the dot plot reflects the consensus opinion of, of the central bank officials. And at the present time, it shows three reductions. And, uh, and the rate, which is currently five and a quarter, five and a half, ends up at four and a half, four and three quarters. And I think we should take the Fed at their word. Now, having said that, Mari, you should note that history shows 
why am I why am I so negative on forecasts? The Fed has hundreds of PhD economists, and history shows clearly that the Fed cannot predict what the Fed is going to do. People have to realize how how unpredictable things are. So I think the current consensus thinking in the market is optimistic. And the current consensus is that the Fed will cut more than the Fed says. The Fed says three times, leading to four and a half, four and three quarters. The market behavior and the bond market pricing, uh, the money market pricing suggests maybe five cuts. And as you say, leading to four, um, uh, 4% uh, Fed funds rate. Uh, I think it's, I, I hate to be on the optimistic edge of things because when optimism is embodied in market prices, what that means is there's room for disappointment. And if we get disappointment, we get losses. Uh, so uh, to the extent that current prices are dependent on there being five cuts, taking the Fed funds rate to 4% uh, percent a year from now, uh, I, I think that's a little optimistic. And I, I would, I would uh, worry about that. There may be some disappointment at right. some time. Exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, in your last memo, uh, the discussion uh, is exactly about the end of the ultra low interest, easy right. money era. Yeah. Uh, this is a topic uh, you've been talking about for a while. So I'm here to, to join the club of those who ask you all the time, as you mentioned also in your memo. Do you think interest rates are going to be higher for longer? Um, you know, I put out a new memo just recently called Easy Money. And uh, I, in there, I say, everybody asks me, are you saying eat higher for longer? And I, one thing I want to make clear to people is today's interest rates are not high. If you look at history, and I give some of the history in the memo, these are normal interest rates, uh, or even on the low side. They're merely higher than they have been for the last dozen years, uh, so, but they're not high. Anyway, I do believe that rates will be will settle out uh, lower than they are uh, today, uh, but um, but not as low as they have been for the, you know, for the last uh, 14 years. The memo that I wrote in December of 22 called Sea Change, and uh, all of your viewers uh, can get the memos if they want to at oaktreecapital.com. Uh, the memo Sea Change uh, examined the period 09 through uh, 2021. And in that period, the Fed funds rate averaged a half a percent, which is extreme relative to history so we're not my the main point is that that was unusual and we're not going back there that's my belief and in the new memo easy money i say that i think that the normal fed funds rate over the next decade or so will be about three to three and a half and i think that's a reasonable forecast now if you think that's higher so be it I, to me, that's low, uh, but uh, but that's anyway. That's what I believe. The point is, we're not going back to zero or a half or one. In this memo, uh, you you argue that uh, ultra low rates uh, cause a lot of um, mm. problems mm. to economy yeah. and and so yeah. on. It's very inter yeah. interesting text I, I've read. Uh, well, you know. Um, this is what happens when governments control prices. That's what interest is. It's the, it's the price of money. And uh, let's say that, uh, oh, let's, what can we think of? Uh, uh, going to the movies. 
let's say the movies cost ten dollars, and uh, some people go and because they enjoy it and they have ten to spend, and other people don't go because they don't want to part with ten dollars. They think that's a, a lot of money. Let's say the government passes a rule that the money that now the movies cost two dollars. So now everybody wants to go to the movies, and the movies are too crowded, and nobody has a good time because there are too many people there and the lines are too long. So it's not a natural interest rate. It's not a natural price to uh, go to the movies. Similarly, I think we should have a nat natural price uh, for money. And when the government sets it too low, there are all kinds of uh, ramifications. Great. Uh, Howard, if the investment environment in the near future will be one with higher interest rates, three to three point five, as as you mentioned, what changes investors need to make in their portfolios or in their investment strategies or maybe in their return expectations? Sure. Well, um, to me, Mari, the, the most important thing is that in that period I mentioned, two thousand and nine to two thousand and twenty one. Uh, Interest rates were unnaturally low. The, the Fed kept uh, the, the rate very low in the beginning to ward off the effects of the global financial crisis. But in the end, I don't think there was a good explanation. They just did it. Um, and uh, th so because the Fed funds rate was so low, the uh, return the yield, the interest that banks paid on cash deposits was zero. And the, the uh, you know, treasury bonds paid one and uh, high grade corporates paid two or three and high yield bonds paid four. And the yields on all fixed income instruments were very low and people lost interest in these things because most Americans don't want to make zero or one or two or three or four. The important thing is now that that fixed income with rates higher, fixed income now has a substantial return and high yield bonds now offer about eight. And eight is, you know, by our standards and based on my experience, a very substantial yield. And so people lived with low yields for so long that they kind of got used to that environment and assumed it would always be the case. And they lost interest in fixed income securities. And my point is that now we're back to a more normal interest rate environment and fixed income securities offer substantial uh, rates of return. And people should put fixed income securities back in their portfolios. You know, fixed income securities are by definition, less risky because the return on a bond or a note or a loan or a, a, whatever you want to call it is a contractual return. You give the, you give the borrower some money and they promise to pay you interest every six months. And then they promise to give you your money back at a fixed point in time. And that is much more dependable than stocks for example, where there is no contract, there's no promised return. The return on the stock is what the market wants to give you. And it's, it's, it's very uh, unpredictable because it's based on that and on how the company does. So the, my point is that if you can get a substantial uh, return contractually on fixed income securities, then uh, you should have a significant component in your portfolio. Now, if a bond offers 8%, you shouldn't expect that you're going to make 10 or 12 or 14. And if the stock market does well, you're not going to keep up with it. But by the same token, it's not going to make six or four or two or zero. It's fixed. We call the, we call this sector fixed income. The outcome is fixed. And it's fixed today, as I say, high yield bonds around eight. To me, that's a substantial number. But, uh, you know, if, if people want to get rich quick, uh, they're not going to do it in the bond market.
Mm-hmm. Should the 60-40 strategy change to 40-60 maybe this year? You know, uh, the, the most important thing to bear in mind is there is no, uh, we have a saying in America, one size fits all. There is no portfolio which is right for everybody. Uh, 60-40 uh, is a, it's just an idea, uh, a guidepost that, that for a, a typical investor, whatever that is, they should have 60% of their money in the stock market and 40% in the bond market, um, or, or fixed deposits. Uh, but that is certainly not correct for everybody. And the, um, you know, uh, uh, we've been uh, investing for people in Brazil uh, for six years now, and we have a very large clientele, thousands of of clients in Brazil. Uh, if you look through the funds that, that we're offering there. And m- as far as I'm concerned, many of them are quite young, early in their careers, very optimistic. And of course, Brazil has a great future um, if it stabilizes and is well governed, has wonderful resources and so many terrific people. So 60-40 normally may be too low for uh, for the typical young uh, Brazilian. Uh, you know, you're the right risk posture for you depends on your circumstances, your uh, aspirations, your uh, ability to live with volatility, and your intestinal strength. Can you can you get through the tough times? Um, And, you know, um, uh, um, the biggest mistake people make is they take on too much risk. And when and they get into a tough period and things go down and they can't live with it. So they panic and they sell when things are down. That is the biggest mistake in that one can make, because when things are depressed, things that most things are selling for less than they're worth. Why would you sell them at that point? But people do because their emotions force them to do so because they took on risks they couldn't live with. And so. Uh, I hope that between you and me and all the other commentators, we can convince people, put, put, take on a portfolio which you can live with in the tough times. It's easy to get through the, the good times, but it's not easy to get through the tough times. And, you know, uh, even in Brazil, people sold things in, uh, in uh, 22 that are worth much more today. So here we are in, in just a year or two, people, some people made a big mistake. And um, so I, I, I have avoided your question, is 60-40 the right number? Um, it, it, on average, young people who, who, are, who can hold stably for a long time, maybe they should even have more in risk securities. Uh, the beauty of fixed income and bonds today is that they are a good, stable, safer substitute for risk assets today than they have been in a long time. Um, and uh, m- maybe that's a good time for me to stop uh, going on. Great. Yes, talking about uh, Brazilian investors, investing abroad is kind of a new thing for the regular Brazilian investor especially investing abroad in fixed income, which was a very popular recommendation last year. Is it a good idea for Brazilians to invest in global fixed income in 2024 when we still have a two-digit interest rate here? Yeah. Risk is subjective. Again, how much risk do you want to take? How much risk can you live with? How much volatility can you live with? When the risk is activated and it produces volatility, will you be comfortable and able to hold 
or will you panic and get out? Now, the obviously, when I'm talking about 8% on U.S. high-yield bonds, you can make that in Brazil and more. Uh, but maybe the typical Brazilian should have some diversification, international diversification. You know, Brazil, as I said earlier, I think has a great future. It has always had a great future, but it has always been very volatile. And so somebody who had all their money invested in Brazil had big ups and downs. And you know, the, the, uh, the political uh, environment changes, the administration changes, and the changes are radical. The swing from left to right and right to left is, is, is very, very active and the environment changes. So if you want, if you don't want to live with that full uh, volatility and you want some stable stability to your portfolio, then international diversification is a good idea. And uh, international fixed income can provide that stability if that's desirable to you. Usually when we uh, take steps to um, uh, access greater safety, greater stability, and greater diversification, we expect to, to give something up. And that is, the, we don't expect to make the, 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 the whole reward that one would make if one was not diversified. But we trade away some upside for stability and insulation from volatility. And again, that's a subjective uh, question that everybody has to answer for themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, I, I think if you invest in U.S. high yield bonds, you can you can get uh, something around 8% a year, dependably. Now, not every year. It, some years it's more and some years it's less. But over the life of the bonds, it'll be 8%. And I think that's a good number. However, of course, you're investing in U.S. dollars. And then you're at the mercy of the exchange rate. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know uh, what's going to be the relationship between the dollar and the Hayish in the future. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know I don't know. There are other people who say they know. They don't know either, in my opinion. Nobody knows. But, um, I, but I, I admit that I don't. And yet, if you invest in international fixed income, that will affect you. But of course, Mari, we don't know how. It may affect you negatively. It may affect you positively. Today's exchange rate is the best predictor of tomorrow's exchange rate. Mo mo very few people know what tomorrow's rate will be. If, the, if everybody agreed that the rate would be different tomorrow, then the diff rate would be different today, wouldn't it? Rational expectations. But, uh, you know, yeah, you, so you, by, 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 by diversifying into international fixed income, you, you cushion your portfolio, you reduce your sensitivity to the inherent volatility of Brazil, you give up some upside, and you expose yourself to exchange rate uncertainty. There is no free lunch. You can't make 8, 10, 12% in the markets uh, without taking on uncertainty and risk. Uh, the, que the only question is, in what form do you want to take that risk? Great. Talking about diversi diversification, um, I'd like to know what are the segments or geographies or investment theses you foresee present the most promising opportunities this year, um, and taking the diversification into account. Well, um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, sticking to, I can't cover the whole world and I'm not an expert in the whole world or, and certainly not, I'm not an expert in the stock market, but if you look at fixed income, uh, you know, there are many ways to invest. Uh, it's hard to know in advance 
uh, which is going to be the best performer. But I think that most of them have a lot of potential. And I think that um, uh, people will be able to accomplish the things I described by investing in the market. Now, should you be in fixed rate or floating rate? Should you be in U.S. or foreign? Emerging market, real estate uh, related loans. Everything has different sensitivities, different potential, and in different environments, some things will do better and some things will do worse. I don't know. So when we manage money, for example, for Brazilians, we we mostly invest in in portfolios that have a variety of exposures. I can't tell you which sector will do best. And so we we uh, reduce our exposure to that uncertainty by investing in many different things. And sometimes we put a little more into A than B, sometimes a little more into B than A. But, uh, you know, we don't claim, as, as you can tell from what I've said earlier, we don't claim to know what the future holds. We only know the we only think we have the ability to to find companies that will borrow your money and then return it as promised. That's the most important thing. And, you know, we have the expression in the U.S. You probably have something similar in Brazil playing the market. I don't believe in playing the market. I don't believe in in buying securities because you think that they'll uh, jump up. You buy them because you want to be a long-term participant in that instrument and in that company. And trading for short-term profits, I think, is a big mistake. Right. Um, Howard, you you reflect a lot about investors' behavior. And recently, you argued that, uh, in, in that last memo you published, you argued that low interest rates encourage risk-taking and lead to potentially unwise investments. What right. do you think are the marks or maybe scars that this recent easy money period followed by uh, hikes in the interest rates uh, left and investors' behavior from now on? Well, I mean, the greatest example is that, um, you know, uh, investing with leverage, that is, put it, not only putting your money into the market, but borrowing more money and putting that into the market. Investing with leverage is a great way to participate in prosperity and in declining interest rates. And when you have the, the tailwind of prosperity and declining interest rates, as the U.S. has had, uh, leveraged investments do best. You know, I, I go to Las Vegas once in a while, and there they say, the more you bet, the more you win when you win. Voila. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not without risk. And... Uh, interest rates declined significantly, not all the time, but on average from 1980 to 2020. And that means that risky and leveraged investing did very well. It was a tailwind, or I say it's like the moving walkway at the airport. It carried people along. So one of the examples is private equity. And private equity did so well for so long that many people said, ah, private equity, there's the answer. There's the secret. That, that's the way to get rich without risk. And uh, the point is, I think we're finished with interest rate uh, declines. I think interest rates will be mostly stable over the coming decade. So they will not have the tailwind of declining interest rates in private equity investments. Leveraged investments will not work as well. And in fact, you asked about the scars. Many companies were bought by private equity funds with leverage and were loaded up with debt uh, that did not anticipate interest rates 500 basis points or five percentage points higher. 
So, you know, at the time people were putting on this debt, maybe interest rates were 1%. And today they're five. And a company that could pay 1% may have trouble paying five. So there may, you know, depending on what the, what climate we see in the years immediately ahead, there may be some shakeout in some of the companies that were, uh, were, were bought uh, by leveraged funds. Mm -hmm. Great. So thank you so much, Howard, for this interview. It was a pleasure to talk to you and I hope that we uh, can do that more times in the future. Well, I'm sure we can, Mari. I I've enjoyed answering your questions. I hope the answers weren't too long and too complex, but you know, this is not an easy subject.